content warning. This episode contains graphic descriptions of violence and death. Viewer discretion is advised. And the task force identified that all of the victims were brunette Caucasian women um, who had been menstruating at the time of their deaths. Murders, mysteries, unexplained stories, and our family's crazy opinions on them all. Join us now. The Family School of Thought is in session. Hey, everybody. Thanks for stopping in again this week. Hope everybody's having a great week. Um, Cassie, what's the weather like out there in Portland? I'm sure you'll be just surprised to hear this, but it is still hot. The world oh. is still on fire, and it is hot out here. It was it's about 80, so it's not like as bad as it could be, but it, we're starting to get like muggy weather because it's just hot and humid and it won't Good. go away. All right. Um, Jess, how's the weather where you're at? Um, a little muggy. I was hoping for some rain. We had some nice thunderstorms last night, though. So it's always a yeah, we had a we had a pretty good storm last night. Mm-hmm. We keep getting promised rain, but it, it has not happened yet. So. But I, I got to say, here in Michigan, I feel like we're, we, and I shouldn't even say this out loud, but I don't think that we've had the normal hot summer that we usually have. Everybody else in the world seems to be having it, but we're not. Are we? Or is it me? No. Um, it's cold. Temperature-wise, it has been super hot, but it's just been so humid and muggy. But... Has it not been a really hot no. So far, but anyway. it's been nice. It's summer's but, over, and yeah, we have yeah, summer is over. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, Jess, why don't you start us out with some uh, history facts? Yes, I got some. I got a couple history unexplained mystery facts. This is the history unexplained mysteries daily calendar for anybody that is wanting to know where I get these facts. If you've been following along with us, um, so the first one is Tucker's missing cross. Um, that was discovered by an explorer, Teddy Tucker, in 1955. The relic known as Tucker's Cross was discovered in the waters of um, waters off of Bermuda within the remains of what is thought to be the uh, Spanish ship San Pedro. And the cross was constructed of gold, of gold with large, brilliant um, emeralds embedded into its face. Tucker, a seasoned treasure hunter and a Bermuda local, sold the cross to the government of Bermuda, which placed the item in a museum. The cross sat in the museum for 20 years until just before Queen Elizabeth II was set to be um, to visit the museum. It was discovered that the original piece had been stolen and a replica had been put in its place. Authorities from the government of Bermuda, the FBI, and Scotland Yard all participated in an investigation and experts believe a professional art thief orchestrated the job considering the care that went into obtaining the the and replacing it with a, a replica so a gold and emerald cross that was discovered um, from the spanish ship san pedro was put into a museum but right before queen elizabeth ii went to go visit the museum they noticed that it was replaced with a look-alike. That's all that's... Well, at least they're not after. Oh. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well... This is mine! <laughs> so, there's, there's that. The second one that I have, I think we all kind of know this, either by its story or from the movies, but um, this is The Flying Dutchman. Please tell me you guys have heard of this. Yes. So, but I thought, well, it's interesting. So the, the marine time legend of the Flying Dutchman has been shared by sailors since the 18th century. And legend claims that in the mid-1600s, Hendrik van der Dicken, his ship and its crew were doomed to sail the ocean forever. Although several marine time histo- historians claim the folklore was most likely born out of a terrible accident that occurred when the ship tried to navigate around Cape of Good Hope off the coast of South Africa but sank, 
There have been countless alleged sightings of the ghost ship over the last few centuries, with some reports surfacing as recently as World War II. And one of the most well-known sightings occurred when the future King George V reportedly spotted the Flying Dutchman off the coast of Australia in 1881. Most reports say the ship appears with e an eerie glowing light surrounding it, and sometimes those aboard attempt to pass messages to other ships. Scientists argue that many of the sightings could be explained through an occurrence of Feta Morgata, which happens when light refracts through the air and at varying temperatures. I would assume this is kind of similar to like an oasis type of like a mirage. Or, yeah, a mirage, yes, not oasis, yeah, a mirage in the desert. But, however, because scientists are unable to observe and test the visual phenomenon, many question whether the sightings are actually that of the phantom ship. So, is it really there? If you ask Disney, yes, it is. It's in several movies. So, there it's you go. It's also in the SpongeBob series. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I was not aware. Yeah, of Daisy Jones is like one of like the big characters of SpongeBob. Oh yeah, you know what? I, now that you say that, that it does ring a bell. Yes, <laughs> yeah. SpongeBob came out when I was a little bit older, so I never really got into it. So, but you never. There you go. SpongeBob. There are my history Me? and mystery yeah. facts. Me, the person who had the portable DVD, like that original portable DVD player that had the. Spongebob episodes on it? Yeah, I watch Spongebob all the time. <laughs> That's a good cartoon. I like I that. I love Spongebob. I think it's still funny. Yeah. Is this the Krusty Krab? Uh, no, this is Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> Odin's starting to get into Spongebob, so <laughs> I may know more in a couple more years. This is there supposed <laughs> to be like a bunch of hidden messages in there. I think it's, an, it's like it's it, a kids show made by an adult, so like there is adult humor adult that humor like that, you know yeah, you don't get the later kids head. Yeah. yeah, right. Like the Barbie movie. Like right. the Barbie movie. Yeah, I did not see that movie yet. So, <laughs> all right. Well, good, Jess. Any more? Anything? No, nope, that's it. That's all I have. Okay, Cass, you got a groovy song for us this week. I've got a song for us this week, and it's, I think it's because, so it's not very much of a creepy song. It's, again, one of those ones where, like, you go back and actually listen to the lyrics, and you're like, uh, wait a minute, um, because uh, it's summertime, and uh, this, this is basically the only season that I will listen to country music, is because I'll be, like, out on the water, and I'll just turn on, like, 90s country hit. I think that's, like, the best music to, that like, is play. good country music, yeah. Yeah. Good, good water music. Um, so I was listening to some 90s country music this week. And I think I could start an entire series of country songs. I'm like, wait a minute. Was that actually what the song was about? <laughs> yeah. yeah so there are quite a few of them that are now on my list where I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, like I, but the chick says Earl has to die. <laughs> yep. Yep. Earl has to die. <laughs> Um, remember, no, I, that's a bop. That's a good you, But do you remember when you were, you loved Shania Twain and I had you convinced that she had one You leg? never had me convinced that she had a wooden <laughs> leg. You never, never, like you tried. Oh, you always wore those high boots. <laughs> you never convinced anybody that that was the thing. I think I had you convinced. <laughs> no. <laughs> but this I think week's song now is like, not Shania, not, Shania. not the chick. <laughs> Okay. Uh, this week's song is um, Don't Take the Girl by Tim McGraw. I'm sure you've heard it? Yeah. Yeah, right? that's a good song. It's a good song, right? Is it? Because yeah, I the, know first, the first that. verse, the first yeah. verse, yeah. it's a boy who doesn't want his dad to take a girl fishing with them. Oh, don't take the girl. Yeah. Oh, no. Second verse? Second verse, literally right after they're eight years old and he doesn't want to take her to go fishing. Second verse, she's being held up at gunpoint. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Out well, of nowhere. Yes. <laughs> I thought they went to teenagers. They, that's what I mean. They're teenagers. Oh, at a, at a theater. 
Batman yep. style being held up at gunpoint. <laughs> yep. And don't take the girl. Take Yeah. And he's like, take my car, take this, which, you know, I get like the message of it, but how do you go from fishing at eight years old to at 18 year old? She's <laughs> wherever they're yep. at. She's being held at gunpoint. Yeah. Like it's a crazy song. And then even like, so that like, he, you know, he, he gives, like he yes, offers all crazy. these things to the robbers. He offers all these things to the robber, and you're like, "All right, is the robber gonna take it? Is he gonna kill the girl? What's gonna happen?" Another flash know. forward ten years. <laughs> no clue. She's having, she's a, having baby. a baby now. <laughs> so she survived. She but did she, did she? Because even at the end of the song, again, she's dying because this yeah. person apparently can't survive. Um, she's dying again in childbirth, which I think mm-hmm. makes a little bit more sense. Maybe the gunpoint yeah. was out of blue, out of the blue. Yeah, but she's dying in childbirth, and so he tells the doctor, "Take my life, take this, take this." Yeah. Do we We're find out if she survived? Okay. No, we have no idea if she survived. You jump forward ten more years. You guys look. You guys look into the music too much. Just listen to the lyric. Don't listen to the lyrics. Just listen to the beat. Survived or not? Listen to the beat. No, to like I, that's, that's the problem is that I was like, I remember this song. I could sing every word. And then I'm like singing every word. And I'm like, and I'm like wait, yeah. what? Yeah. I remember thinking that back, back when it was popular and on the radio all the time. I'm like, hmm, this is kind of a morbid song. <laughs> but it's supposed to be like a love story song kind of thing. A- <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just, I was, I was shocked at how we went from eight years old doesn't want to take her fishing to 18 years old and she's being held at gunpoint. Yeah. <laughs> that I got me. I, I know the song, but I can't think of the words. I guess I'm going to have to start listening. Oh, I know the song. song. I can sing it right now. Not like <laughs> word word. Right I, I liked it better when we could listen to the song. But did you listen to the song is the question. <laughs> no, I don't listen to the song. We, we probably listened to it weren't paying attention. I get the point. I remember... I'm sure there's a video on this because it's like, I remember the whole premises of, you know, I can don't tell take the girl because I want to go fishing and then don't take the girl because I'm in love with her. Yeah. And then yeah, yeah. 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 I get it. It's a- it, it, I get it that it's supposed to be a love song. I do. I really do. But like, you could have anything else but her being on the go me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll have to. It's like that, like urban myth fear that like every small town person is like, oh, when you go in the big city, well, they're gonna you go back you and to some old country songs. There's some really offensive things in there. Uh, that yeah, were big hit songs. Yeah, yeah. Um, Conway. Like did. I said, I could have Con- a whole. You know Conway. Series. I love Conway Twitty. You know that. But some of the songs, <laughs> stop to think about it. It's like, oh. yeah, there was a couple of his on there that I was like. Wait, what? Is that what this song? Wait, wait a minute. And, and, yeah. Oh, no, that was Porter Wagner that had the Cassie song. About Cassie in the Meadow. and Yeah. <laughs> it was a creepy song. That's yeah. where we named it from that song. No, I hope not. not. That is such a creepy song. It is a no. very creepy song. So. No, we did not. <laughs> All right, well... Okay. Anything else with that, Cassie? No, that's about that's about it for that song. We won't we'll even get started on his wife. Because <laughs> she's got a couple of them as well. Yeah. Jess, tell the folks how they can find us. You can listen to us on any podcast. I'm assuming since you're listening that you found us on a podcast platform somewhere. But you can also watch us on YouTube. Um, but any, uh, any podcast that you want to listen to, have us join your car rides. I'm sure you want to listen to us bicker on your car rides. <laughs> Maybe you want to listen to us right before you're going to sleep. Listen to those murder stories. You're awake. <laughs> on long trips. I'm sure like our voices are very soothing. Yeah, very soothing. <laughs> <laughs> or be, again, if you want to, if you want to feel like, put us in your living room on your TV, make us part of your family. Get us on YouTube at the Family School of Thought. Subscribe. Click that like button. 
send us an email at the family school of thought at gmail.com. Very good. Very good. Okay. I'm always looking for recommendations. So send them my way. Send those recommendations. I will, I will give everybody out there a little hint. Well, I'm not for sure we're doing this, but if you guys want to catch up on Donnie Darko, it might come in handy soon. Yeah. So, Maybe soon. Um, we couple weeks. At our last time, the uh, last uh, podcast. Yeah. We cut it out. Oh, oh did we? <laughs> because we, we basically told the entire story of Donnie Darko, okay. so I had to cut it out. <laughs> so preview, if you're interested. <laughs> uh, anyways, if you guys watch, um, if you get a chance to watch Donnie Darko before, I don't know when that will play, but uh, uh, get familiar with that movie. You know, I think we're going to do an episode on it. Okay? We might be discussing Right. Discussing that. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it is Jesse's turn, right? Yes. Okay. I have a, 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 I can't talk today. I have a Michigan murder story. Ooh. A murder. There's more of those than I thought there were. There are. Oh, there's a ton, isn't there? There yeah. are. This one is very interesting. I had no clue about it. And I don't know how it's not more well known, but so this is the killer John Norman Collins. He is known as he's got many alias, aliases. One is the Mis the Michigan murderer. One is the Ypsilanti Ripper and the co-ed killer. So he had multiple names. Um, and it, this happened in the 60s. So um, the Michigan murders, it was a series of highly publicized killings of young women that were committed between 1967 and 1969 in the Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti area, which is southeast Michigan for our viewers that aren't familiar with Michigan. Um, but it was by the individual. Um, he had those three names. I think those are, I think he had like the Ann Arbor Ripper as well, too, just because of the location. Um, which where, where is that, a college but, town, by the way. What, yes, Ann Arbor is where the University right, of Michigan is right located. There. Ypsilanti is right there. You know, it's very close. So, um, yeah, so the Ypsilanti Ripper, the Michigan murder, and the co ed killer, all the same person. Um, John Norman Collins. So he targeted young women. Often they were college students, which also gave, which that's why he had the nickname, the co-ed killer. Um, his victims ranged in the, between the ages of 13 and 21. And they were all abducted, raped, beaten, and murdered. Um, and they were typically murdered by stabbing or strangulation. And with their bodies, um, some of the bodies of the, the girls were mutilated after they died. Um, and then they were discarded. All the bodies were discarded within a 15 mile radius of each other in Washtenaw County, uh, Michigan. So um, in the two years, um, he had at least seven victims that we know of or that have been um, kind of confirmed I think six or seven, we'll get to that one, six or seven, but that have been kind of confirmed. Um, he was arrested um, and convicted of only one murder. So there was seven, at least seven victims, only convicted of one, um, which is the last one that he committed. And um, <clears throat> we'll, 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 I'm going to put this out there. He was not very smart. I mean, we've talked about murders that like serial serial killers in the past. Most of them are kind of smart and like like strategic. I like. I feel like he was trying to get caught, or he just didn't care. Maybe he was just that much of like a narcissist that he thought he could get away with it. But it this one is a story of like. Unfortunately, the police department didn't do its job. So. But he, so getting back to the story, not my opinions on this one anymore, but um, he was arrested one week after his final murder and he was sentenced to life in prison um, for that final murder that, um, and he was sentenced on August 19th, August 19th of 1970. Uh, he is still incarcerated 
at the G. Robert Cotton Correctional Facility. I am not sure if that's in Michigan or not. Let me. Oh, yeah, I was wondering about that. I'm not. I didn't really pay attention to it too much before, so I'm not sure where he's at. But he is still alive. He's still in prison. Um, he so John Norman. Um, his name now is Chapman. He changed his last name to Chapman after he was sentenced. Um, he was born on June seventeenth, nineteen forty-seven. And um, he was born in Windsor, Canada. He had two older siblings, a brother and a sister, and his father abandoned his mother and the children shortly after John was born. His father was reportedly a very abusive alcoholic. And when his mom remarried for the second time, he was, she remarried again to another abusive alcoholic. And when he, John was two, his stepfather threw him across the family vehicle in a fit of rage that was aimed at John's mother. And on other occasions, his stepfather provoked an argument with another man who then put a gun on him. And to defend himself, John's stepfather used the uh, then four-year-old John as a human shield. So not a great, great upbringing. Um, in 1951, his mother left his stepfather and moved the three children to Detroit, Michigan. And then she remarried again for the third time. She married William Collins, who adopted all three kids. Um, and he was also an alcoholic and uh, was frequently very physical and abusive. Um Back up to, he changed his name after he was sentenced to um, his last name to Chapman, which was his father's name. So when he got adopted by the third husband, his name was changed, his last name was changed to Collins. So he went back to his biological father's last name. Um, so kind of back up on that one. But so, and then by 1956, John's mother and William got a divorce and Despite all this, he was, um, in like his childhood leading up, leading up to this, he was an honor student. He was the captain of a football te- the football team. He was the star pitcher at his uh, high school baseball team and was, by all counts, a very popular and successful um, student throughout his high school career. In 1965, he began to study um, education at Eastern Michigan University, which is I believe it's located in Ypsilanti. Um, it is. Yeah, it's right yeah. there. Right there. Yeah, it's like right there. But um, So he started um, studying at Eastern Michigan, and he was in a fraternity, but he was kicked out due to suspicions of him stealing. And he, w- like he was a su- successful student and relatively popular on campus. Um, he dated um, lots of young women, um, so, he, like, he was kind of that picture-perfect all-American boy kind of thing. Um, but many of the women that he dated often said that he was angry and sexually aggressive. Um, and then during his sophomore year, his grades began to drop, and he was accused of cheating in a class. And um, for he was accused for other petty thefts around campus. And then in 1966, John learned that his sister was pregnant by a man other than her husband, and he became enraged, and he beat the man up until he was unconscious, and then he beat his sister up and then called her a tramp. So wow. that that is, like, the backstory of John Norman Collins slash Chapman. Um, soon after that... This is when we know he began his um, killing streak, I guess you want to call it. Um, So the first known victim that was linked to the Michigan murderer, John Norman Collins, was 19-year-old Eastern Michigan University accounting student named Mary Therese Fleezar. But she was last known to be seen alive on the evening of July 9th, 1967, And she was seen by a neighbor walking towards her Ypsilanti apartment. And the neighbor twice observed a man with blue-gray Chevrolet slowing to a halt beside her and beginning to talk to her. And each time she had shaken her head and walked away from the car. 
Um, later, her nude body was found by two 15-year-old boys on an abandoned farm in Superior Township <clears throat> on August 7th. So, the, like, we're right on the timeline for this one. I didn't realize it kind of mm -hmm. perfect, you know, um, August 7th. Um, we're kind of on the anniversary of some of these. Um, and um, so, her, sorry, got off track on that one. Her body was found on August 7th by two 15 year olds. Um, and she was identified by her dental records the following day. Um, her corpse was so badly decomposed that um, the pathologist who examined her remains was able to determine that she had been stabbed, but even though it was decomposed, they were able to um, determined that she was stabbed approximately 30 times in the chest and abdomen with a knife or other sharp, sharp object, and that her feet had been severed just above the ankle. Um, the thumb and sections of her fingers of one hand were missing, and um, one forearm had been severed from her body. Um, they were the these severed appendages that are like her fingers and her forearm, they were never found. They we don't nobody ever know, knew what happened with them. Um, and despite the advanced stages of decom, uh, decompensation of her body, he was, the pathologist was also able to locate multiple lineal abrasions upon her chest and torso, indicating that um, she was, um, had been extensively beaten before her death. And although the police theorized that Fleas are had been raped. The advanced state of her body, the decom, uh, decomp decomposition of her body, what it really kind of erased all of the evidence on it. You know, like they couldn't conclusively say that she was assaulted. Um, a detailed examination of the crime scene revealed that the body had been moved three times throughout the month that it had laid undiscovered. So initially, the body had been laid on, on top of a pile of bottles and cans observed, uh, obs obscured from view by elder trees. But, and then before, it, it, it was later dragged about five feet from that location into a field where it had remained exposed throughout much of that time, and, but it laid undiscovered. And then shortly before the body was discovered, the murderer went back and had returned to the body and moved it another Three feet out so it was more visible um again this is where i'm saying that you know like i feel like he was like trying to get caught you know um he went back to the body multiple times he didn't try to hide it he tried to make it so people would find him He's literally going back and going like really you yeah. can't see and that nobody, and nobody <laughs> found any dna to Convince, convince well, this him. was back in the 60s, so like, right. well, and her body was so decomposed by this point because it'd been laying out in the all this was in J July and July. August, so yeah. it'd been laying outside in the elements for about a month, so yeah. um, so it was really decomposed. But during her funeral, when she was um, being or when um, the funeral home was preparing her body for the funeral, which I don't know why if. She was de de decomposed. I don't know why they'd have an open casket. Maybe they didn't, but they were preparing her body. A young man came to the funeral home and he said he was a friend of Mary's um, and her family and wanted to take some pictures of the body so that the family had some keepsakes. And the funeral okay. home. Wait yeah, a minute. Yes, yes. And so the funeral home informed the man that, that it wasn't possible in which he responded with like, quote unquote, you mean you can't fix her up enough so I could just get one picture of her. Oh. And so he left and he was angry, but he left the funeral home. It like didn't really push it beyond that point when the funeral home like staff asked the family about it. They had no clue. They, they did not ask anybody to go to the funeral home to take any kind of pictures they had no idea. So the police asked um, the funeral home person that talked to him to describe what the male, the person looked like. And he was described as a young white male. He was very handsome with dark hair and he drove a blue gray Chevy. Doesn't go well, into I mean, what, what kind of vehicle. It just says it's a Chevy. So I don't know. Probably if it's a Chevy truck. truck. Or car. You know, I don't know. But 60s, probably a Chevy truck. Yeah. So, so. 
that is kind of, you know, like they, nobody really knew who killed her and life moved on, unfortunately. On June 30th, 1968, so about a year later, 20-year-old Joan Shell was traveling to Ann Arbor to visit her boyfriend, but she missed the bus from um, her, like, Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti area um, to get to Ann Arbor. Um, I'm sorry. Um, I guess she was traveling to Ann Arbor. Let's back up on that one. She missed the bus, um, and so she decided to hitchhike. So she could go see her boyfriend. Um, well, she was with. Idea. Well, it was back in the '60s, you know, almost '70s. But her roommate, who had walked her to the bus stop, um, her name is Susan Kolb, and um, she said a vehicle um, stopped to pick her up, and she saw the driver that the driver was a young male, around 20 years old. He was clean cut with short dark hair, and her roommate begged um, Joan Shell not to accept the ride but joan was determined to go see her boyfriend so she said hey i'm gonna go i'll call you when i get there so you know i arrive safely and um her roommate never got that call so her roommate um after a uh, joan um checked in with sue uh, susan um uh, within like a few hours she decided to report her as missing to the cops so she was reported missing almost immediately, you know, within hours because she knew she was hitchhiking and everything. Um, Joan's body was discovered on July 5th, 1968. Um, she was partially decomposed and her body was mutilated. Um, and it was found by a construction worker in the, on the Ann Arbor roadside. Um she would, had been raped and then stabbed 25 times with a knife, estimated to have been measured about four inches in length. Several of the wounds had punctured her lungs, liver, and um, um, some arteries. And with one additional wound inflicted behind her left ear, fracturing her skull. So she was stabbed in the head as well. Um, in addition, her throat had been slashed. And her mini skirt had been tied around, like taken off and tied around her neck. Um, although Joan had been dead for several days, um, her entire lower body was in remarkably preserved conditions, whereas her head, shoulders, and breasts were in an advanced state of decom uh, decomposition, leading the pathologist to conclude that her body had been stored in a naturally cool environment but with the upper third of her body exposed to the natural heat. Um, and then the lack of blood beneath, um, beneath her or near her corpse, plus the testimony of eyewitnesses that led the investigators to determine that Joan's body had laid in its present location for less than 24 hours. And her murderer had likely driven to that location to dispose of her body before making a, um, efforts to conceal the body with clumps of grass. So again, he like moved the body, didn't really attempt too hard to hide the body, but kind of hit her a little bit. Um, but her body was put in that location and found less than 24 hours later. So I like, I feel like he's like every time was just trying to, this is my opinion for entertainment purposes, I guess, but my opinion is he like put it in locations so that they would be discovered. Um, Two months yeah, after, yeah, no to get caught. I think he was doing it to be like, "Ha ha! Look what I can do!" Kind of, kind of like. like the Zodiac killer, almost like, right. like you no, know, he just. I don't feel like he was smart enough. Um, but I don't know. So, two months after Jones' murder, police inquiries um produced two further eyewitnesses for her her investigation, and they both stated that they had observed Joan walking with a young man along Emmett Street where she and John Norman Collins both lived. And um, they, they, this was on the evening that she disappeared. So to, we have two eyewitnesses that told the police that they saw her walking with Collins, jo um, John Norman Collins, on the street that they live on, or they lived on at that time. Um, and then they were, the police were told that the man seen picking up Joan looked very similar to her neighbor, John Norman Collins. Um, and he was 
match to the sketch of a man who was asked to take pictures of um, he was this the per, the sketch of the man that um, the funeral home director kind of uh, gave his interpretation of right, right. the police for Mary Flasher uh, Flazer's fu um, funeral. Um, so he matched that description as well. I don't think I saw that very clearly. I'm sorry. Um, but the police, and so the police questioned John Norman Collins and he denied knowing who Joan was. Um, and he said that he spent the weekend that Joan disappeared with his mother in center lane or, or center line, Michigan. Um, and the police believed him and didn't verify his alibi, didn't go any further. They just trusted him on his word and they moved on. Um, even though they had, you know, eyewitnesses that and multiple eyewitnesses really that kind of showed his description. So um, March 20th, 1969. So, you know, about uh, seven months later, um, a 23 year old University of Michigan law student, Jane Louise Mixer, disappeared. And she was um, she had posted a note on the college bulletin board asking for a ride across Michigan to her hometown in Muskegon. And she had recently become engaged and she was wanting to travel back home to tell her parents about the engagement and plan to, um, and her plans to move to New York with her in, uh, fiance, soon to be husband. Um, her body was fully clothed, cl her body was fully clothed and covered with her own raincoat with a copy of the novel Catch 22 placed by her side when she was discovered in um, a Denton, Denton cemetery in Van Buren Township. Jane's autopsy and murder scene revealed many differences from the murders of Mary and Joan. And she was found, because she was found, one, fully clothed, she had also been shot twice in the head with a 22 cal uh, caliber pistol. There were no signs of any sexual assault for, the, uh, for her case. And despite these facts that um, really like the murder scenes didn't match up with the other two. Um, and there was no, she was not subjected to a sexual assault. She heard the fact that her tights had been lowered to expose her thighs and she was wearing a sanitary napkin or like a, um, a pad. Mm -hmm. um, she, it was suggested that there was a sexual motive behind the murder and although the victim had not been beaten or stabbed or mutilated, um, her student status, along with um, the tying of a garment around her neck and the proximity of her abduction and murder led the investigators to tentatively link her murder to those of Mary and Joan. And indicated this indicated that there was a serial killer on the loose in Michigan. Um, and that kind of really put that serial killer killer status out in the public for that. Um, this was like serial killers. I mean, we have like the Zodiac killer, but this was before, you know, Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahmer, or John Wayne Gacy. So the term serial killer wasn't really wild, wildly known by this time. Um, so it kind of, I think at this point, it really like started freaking everybody out a little bit. Um, but four days after the discovery of um, Jane Mixer's body, on March 25th, a, a surveyor discovered the nude mutilated body of a teenage girl lying upon a blue jacket behind a vacant house on a remote rural section of Earhart Road. And it was just a few hundred yards from where the body of Joan Shell had been discovered eight months previously. Investigators called the crime scene and noted a dramatic increase in the savagery exhibited against this victim, um, which is the, the teenage victim. Um, and with one investigator describing the injuries inflicted upon the victim as being the worst that he had seen in the 30 years of his police work. Um, the subsequent, subsequent autopsy revealed that the victim had died of numerous fractures covering one third of her skull and one side of her face, um, and all which had been inflicted with a heavy blunt instrument. 
Um, the, the injuries had been inflicted after the victim had been extensively be beaten and tortured, and her killer had placed a section of her own skirt into her trachea to muffle her screams as she received extensive blunt force trauma to her face, head, and body, including several deep lacerations believed to have been inflicted with a leather strap. Um, there were welt marks upon her chest and shoulders, indicating that the killer had also used restraints to hold her down um, as he whipped her um, in, in the torso and upper legs with that leather belt. Um, before tearing a, a tearing a branch from a nearby tree and inserting it um, eight inches into her vagina. Um, blood spatters um, and then the churned up soil close to the crime scene indicated that she had been beaten close to where her body was discovered and that she may have attempted to escape her, her attacker. Um, this victim was identified as a 16-year-old Romulus high school student, um, Marilyn Skeleton. Um, and she had disappeared while hitchhiking in Ann Arbor. She was last seen alive outside of a drive-in restaurant in Washtenaw, on, or sorry, on Washtenaw Avenue, two days before her body was discovered. Although the autopsy report indicated that Marilyn had died between 24 and 36 hours before her, her body was discovered. And then following the discovery of Marilyn's body, authorities formed a coordinated task force from five different jurisdictions. And the task force identified that all of the victims were brunette Caucasian women um, who had been menstruating at the time of their deaths. And um, the police found that all of the victims had similar wounds that had something tied around their necks, linking all four murders together. All, there all was, the girls were on their period? All the girls were on their periods. Um, now, how would he know that? I, I mean, don't know. I have no idea. I can't tell you that. On April 16th, 1969, another body was found. This time it was the, uh, identified as the 13 year old Dawn Louise Basom. And she was found on um, an, a, like an a old dirt road, basically in Ypsilanti. She was dressed only in her blouse and bra and was, and those were pushed up to her neck and she was stabbed numerous times in the chest and in the genitals. She had slash wounds on her torso, breast, and butt, and she was also strangled with an electrical cord, and a handkerchief was placed in her mouth. There was no conclusive evidence of sexual assault with her. Doesn't mean that she wasn't raped, but there was no conclusive evidence um, that she was. So, um, um, Dawn was a middle school student at the time of her death. And she was last seen in um, the night before her body was found, walking home from a friend's house less than a mile from her house. Her sweater and other items of clothing were later located in an abandoned farmhouse near where her body was found. And in the farmhouse, police also found fresh human blood stains, indicating that the murder had occurred at that farmhouse and her body was later dumped where to the location where she was found. And while searching the house, Marilyn Skeleton's earring was also found, linking the cases together once again. And in May of that year, an arsonist set fire to that house. Um, there were five. So that farmhouse burned down. And um, later it was discovered that there was flat five clipped lilacs that were laid near the um near the burnt down house, and they was thought to be placed, those were thought to be placed there by um, John Collins to um, symbolize the five victims that had lost lost their lives there. So they, the police kind of really determined that that farmhouse is where all of the women died. And then they were taken from that location to wherever they were found. And um, whose farm was it? I mean, I, you know, I didn't really, I, it was an abandoned farmhouse, so I don't know. It didn't, you know, it didn't nobody really, there was no it. really information on who owned it, you know. So, um, and then less than two months after Dawn Basm um, was discovered on June 9th, 
three teenage boys discovered a partially nude body of a young woman in the field close to the abandoned farmhouse on North Territorial Road. Um, the victim had received multiple slashes and stab wounds to the body, including two stab wounds, which had pierced her heart and a gunshot wound to the forehead before her neck had been cut through into the spine. And the victim's right thumb had also received a gunshot wound, suggesting that the woman had instinct instinctively raised up her hand to protect herself um, before the killer had fired the gun at a point blank range. Um, she had also been raped, although the pathologist was unable to determine whether this act had occurred before or after she died. Um, sections of her clothing were scattered around her body, and although one of her shoes, although one of her shoes remains missing, you don't know what happened to it. Um, the victim was identified the following day as 21-year-old University of Michigan graduate student named Alice Elizabeth Colum, or Colum. Um, and she had disappeared shortly after midnight the morning of June 8th, and she was last seen walking home toward her apartment on Thompson Street, having um, attended after attending a friend's party. The discovery of several dried blood stains and two buttons missing from her raincoat at um, a Northfield Township commercial grave, gravel pit on June 10th indicated that the victim had been murdered at the gravel pit and then later moved to where she was found. Investigators had publicly claimed prior to um, Alice's uh, murder that they were satisfied uh, that the third victim, initially linked to the Michigan murderer, Jane Mixer, had been killed by a separate perpetrator and the fact that um, Alice had also received a gunshot wound to the head led the investigators to reconsider that possibility and um, that Mixer had, may have been murdered by the same person. So initially they thought uh, they linked them together. Then they kind of in their investigation determined that, um, that uh, Jane Mixer was killed by somebody separate. Um, and then now because of this gunshot wound, they kind of linked them back together um for that and so uh, during this time across the eastern michigan university and university of michigan campuses female students were beginning to pan to panic again this was like when the serial killer term kind of it was around that time where it was starting to become used um so there's a lot of panic um it was believed that the killer was likely a student at one of the universities and so girls began using the buddy system while walking anywhere that they went on campus or um, anywhere, you know, where they were walking anywhere so that they were never alone. Um, and the sales for tear gas, knives, and security locks skyrocketed in that area. Um, hitchhi hitchhiking, which was very popular in that, in that time period, I think we all know that, um, it became very rare and dangerous in the Ypsilanti Ann Arbor area. Um, and then there was a reward for $42,000 that was offered for any valid information on who the killer would be. But remember, you we had two eyewitnesses plus the funeral home staff person that really already identified who the killer was. And the police interviewed him and were satisfied with his alibi. So um, today that reward, it was $42,000 back then. Today, it would be over $321,000. So quite a big reward, I think. Um, but by July 1969, um, as a result of the coordinated investigations into all of the killings, um, more there were more than um, 1,000 convicted sex offenders that were investigated, and they were eliminated as suspects. Over 800 tips um, from, um, from informants had been actively investigated, and there were several thousand individuals routinely interviewed. So the police were doing a lot of work, just not taking care of the things right under their nose, apparently. Um, he was with his mom. What were they supposed to do? So, yeah. Um, and then at the request of an Ann Arbor Citizens Committee, um, a Dutch dad, you're going to like this. Listen up. So at the request of an Ann Arbor citizens community, a Dutch psychic named Peter uh, Hukos, Hukos, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, 
traveled to Washtenaw County on July 21st, and he gen- he was there to generate a psychic profile for the murderer. So he brought in a psychic. They brought in the psychic. Um, was he, able to he, he accurately predicted that the murderer was a strongly built white male under the age of 25 who had been born outside of the United States and who rode a motorcycle. Um, having this, having led the investigators to the precise location where each victim's body had been discovered, he also revealed details of the murders to the investigators, which had not been released to the press. And although the information proved to be little help um, throughout the actual manhunt um, to find who the murderer was, he also predicted that the individual would shortly strike one final time. So he predicted there was going to be one final murder. That was it. As a psychic, I think he did what he was supposed to do. He just didn't get the guy, you know? So June, or I'm sorry, not June, July 23rd. So this was, he predicted, um, what did he, did I say? On July 25th, or I'm sorry, July 21st, the psychic came out and, took, you know, went through all that with the investigators. On July 23rd, 1969, um, an Eastern Michigan University student, Karen Sue uh, Byman, was reported missing. So two days later, she was reported missing by her roommate after she failed to return after curfew. And she was last seen around noon on her way to a wig shop downtown. Three days later, her body was discovered nude and face down in a wooded gully. Um, the autopsy revealed that she had been beaten extensively and had lacerations to um, lacerations so severe that in nearly all of her skin on her breast had been removed. Um, and it revealed um, the deep tissue under her skin. Um, she also had a severe sick. What? This guy is sick. Yeah, I, I guess we should have put like a warning on this one. It's kind of graphic a little bit. Um, yeah. She also had a severe skull fracture and brain injuries, and she was also burned on on her breasts and had pieces of cloth in her throat. She mm. ultimately died of strangulation, and Karen had been raped before she was murdered, and her torn undergarments, so her torn underwear, um, were found inside her vagina. On, um, on the, her underwear... Authorities collected human semen and hair clippings. And the police also noticed that Karen was a Burnett and was menstruating at the time of her murder. So checks all the boxes. Burnett, white male, or I'm sorry, white female rather, um, who was on her period. Upon retracing Karen's movement on the day of her disappearance, police questioned the owner of the wig shop that she was visiting immediately prior to her disappearance. And um, the owner of the the wig shop, I think it was the owner or worker, at least Diana Joan Gosh um, recalled that Karen visited the store and purchased a $20 headpiece in the early afternoon of July 23rd. She also recalled having observed a young man with short, side-parted dark hair wearing a horizontal striped sweater waiting on a blue motorcycle outside the shop as Karen made her purchase. Remember the motorcycle? The psychic predicted the motorcycle. So, um, reportedly, um, Karen insisted that Diana observed the man um, with whom she had accepted a ride uh, with, stating that she had made two foolish errors in her life, purchasing a wig and accepting a ride from a stranger. So it was kind of like a little joke that she made before stating, I've got, quote, I've got to be either the bravest or the dumbest girl alive because I've just accepted a ride from this guy. And Diana observed um, Karen climb onto the motorcycle before the young man, or uh, before the young man who she... With, she climbed on the motorcycle, accepting the ride, basically. I can't talk today. I'm sorry. Before they drove away. Um, so mindful of the fact that the killer had evidently returned to the sites of his previous murders and moved the bodies to the locations where they were found, the 
possibly in a sex, they believed in a sexual ritual. The police theorized that he may also attempt to return to the latest crime scene. And although earlier attempts to enforce news blackouts to the discovery of Don, um, Don and Alice had proven unsuccessful on this occasion with, uh, with Karen's body, police were successful in um, ordering the news blackouts relating to the discovery of her body. So they put her, back where they found her basically and um they replaced it or, or i'm sorry they didn't replace her they replaced her body with a like uh, a mannequin from i i read somewhere it was a jc penny's ma mannequin so they put a you know a dummy down basically um in that gully surrounding and they surrounded the mannequin with monitors and undercover officers so they were trying to set up like a sting to to catch this guy at approximately 12 15 a.m the um in that following morning in a mist of heavy humid storm one officer observed a young man running from the gully but the rain it was a heavy rain and the insects um were very like heavy in that area too it prevented the officer from observing the young man actually approaching the gully and although this officer attempted to radio this sighting to his colleagues, the rain had rendered his radio inoperative. So he was never able to like fully get in touch with anybody. And then the man that he saw was never captured, nor was he identified. Um, so somebody went, but they weren't sure if it was the killer or not. So the description of um, the young man that Karen had was last seen with um, alive was heard by the patrolman um, Larry Mathwasson, um, who believed the person that was described by Diana uh, Ghosh and the others um, was John Norman Collins. And when he questioned John Collins on July 25th as to where he was two days earlier, John admitted that on the date in question, he had been riding his um, Triumph Bonneville in the, I, th I think that's a motorcycle. I, I'm assuming that's a motorcycle in the vicinity, in that vicinity, and that he had stopped to uh, converse with a former girlfriend of his while he was um, in that area. Um, this former girlfriend was able to provide the police officer um, with two recent photos of John Collins and when the police officer showed these photographs to both Diana and her assistant, Patricia Spalding, both women were adamant that the man in the photographs was the same person that Karen was last seen alive with riding off and with on the motorcycle. And while they were investigating, while the investigation into Collins, they learned that there were several of his former girlfriends had reported him as being angry and sexually aggressive and he became enraged when they were menstruating. So he became very upset when they were on their period. He even said that he could tell when women were menstruating because he could smell it. So does that answer your question, Dad? Yeah. 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 His co-workers said he frequently talked about murders and gave graphic details not released. He, I'm sorry. He frequently talked about these murders, the murders, his murders, and gave graphic details that were not released to the public. He later said that his uncle, who was also a police officer, provided him um, with these details. So that's why he knew more information about than the, what was being released to the public. And his that police uncle, officer that was in uh, Gully was probably his uncle. I, I don't think so. But maybe. But his uncle denied ever sharing any of these details and basically said, I'm not like my job is important. I'm not going to be stupid enough to share these details. Um, so John Norman Collins um, had been acquainted with what they ended up discovering in this investigation that he had been acquainted with most of the victims or had lived nearby all of the victims. And a former girlfriend lived in the same apartment complex as young Don Bazam and confirmed that John had met the young girl on multiple occasions. And after being identified in a lineup, he refused a polygraph test. And his roommate said that after he became a suspect, John Collins destroyed a box with shoes, 
a purse, and other items believed to be the missing items from the murder scene. Oh. It was discovered that while John Collins' uncle, the police officer, was on vacation, John stayed at her at his house, and this was during about the same time that Karen disappeared, and upon his return, the um, uncle notified his colleagues that he had found numerous red stains that he believed to be blood, and upon investigation, it was determined that it was just paint. However, while searching the home, the police found numerous hair clippings that matched those found on Karen's body. And the clippings were not of John Norman Collins's but, um, or of Karen's, but they matched the uncle's small children's hair who normally had their hair cut in the basement. Um, and they had just cut their hair shortly before they went on vacation. So um, it was these, the uncle's kid's hair that was found on Karen um, and at, at the house. They also found small blood stains in the basement that matched the blood type of Karen. And a neighbor recalled witnessing John Collins leaving his uncle's home with a deluxe laundry detergent box and hearing muffled screams the night before. So um, com he was confronted with all of this evidence against him. And when he was confronted, John Collins burst into tears, but con continued to deny that he was involved in any of the murders. However, with the hairs matching and the other evidence that led to um, John Norman Collins to be arrested, and he was charged with Karen um, Bainman's murder. So that's the one that he was charged with, the very last one. Mm. While he was awaiting trial, police learned of another, another possible victim in California. Um, on June 30th, 1969, a 17-year-old Roxy Ann Phillips was murdered in um, Salinas, California. I don't know if I pronounce that city right, but um, Roxy had informed friends that she had a friend named John who had uh, who was attending Eastern Michigan University. And upon investigation, it was determined that John and his roommate had traveled to that city in California on June 29th. And Roxy's nude body was found in a ravine with the dress around her neck. She had been strangled and one earring was missing. Mm -hmm. John was formally charged with Roxy Phillips' mur uh, murder in April of 1970. And he went to trial for the murder of Karen on June 2nd, 1970 in Ann Arbor. Um, John Collins chose not to take the stand in his um, his own defense. And the primary evidence against him included the clerk's identification of him, of him with Karen, the um, wig shop clerk, the um, blood stains in his, or the blood in his uncle's home and the hairs from his cousins found um, in Karen's underwear in, in her vagina, apparently too. Um, the defense claimed that the forensics were unreliable and the police were guilty of harassing John Collins. So that's what his defense was. On August 19th, 1970, he was found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. Um, during the trial, <clears throat> the police realized that most of the victims re resembled. Who do you think they resembled? His mom's his mom. mom. His mom. They resembled his mom. They also noted that the murders stopped right after he was arrested and that his mother and his sister defended him, insisting that he was innocent and being railroaded. Um, John Collins had appealed his conviction several times but was unsuccessful. And police found more evidence that Collins was guilty of the killing of the other victims, although he was never charged with um, any of them except for Karen's. For example, John and um, Fleeger were working in the same building at the time that she died. And then another witness said that he saw Joan Shell with Collins the night of her disappearance. And another witness claimed that John Collins had an argument with Alice Coleman shortly before she was killed. And a boot print on her body matched Collins's boot. Around the time of Roxy Phillips's murder, John was treated in California for um, 
for a, a, an outbreak. This is a, a medical term. I don't know how to pronounce, but he had an outbreak from poison oak. So he had poison oak um, poison, or rash, you know, whatever you want to call that. Um, and Roxy's body was found in a patch of poison oak. Oh, huh. mm -hmm. so yeah. In yeah. 19, this is again, like he was not smart. I feel like he was trying to get caught. He just wasn't, I don't, I don't know, whatever. But in he's 1980, <laughs> right, I think he, maybe he's just that big of a narcissist that he thought he could get away with it. I don't think it sounds very narcissistic. Yeah. In even, even like the poison oak thing, like, you know, he, I don't think it would be like him not realizing it. I think he's just be like, no one would ever connect the dots. Yeah, there. right. They won't connect the dots on this. Yeah, I don't know. So, and then in 1980, John changed his last name to Chapman. I already kind of said some of this. It was the last name of his biological father. Um, he is a dual citizen of the United States and of Canada. Um, and he requested to be transferred to a prison in Canada instead of the United States. Um, and that request was originally granted, but it was reversed in the wake of public out, um, outrage uh, when the public learned that Canada would likely parole him. So I think he probably was smart enough to figure that one out. And, oh, yeah, let me get transferred to Canada and then I can get paroled and be free. So mm -hmm. um, And start all over again. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So. He's still in prison. Um, he's still in the, with no parole, um, possible no possible possibilities of parole. But in June, um, sorry, July of 2005, there were DNA evidence from the murder of Jane Mixer was identified that John Norman Collins was not her killer. Um, the killer was actually 62 year old Geary. Gary Lederman, who was a former nurse, and he was identified as the killer and charged with her murder. Um, Jane's murder was significant. It was significantly different than all the other murders by John Collins, um, and because she mostly because she was found clothed and she was shot. Um, so um, Gary Lederman was convicted and sentenced to life without parole as well, and he is not considered a suspect in any of the other murders. So. Um, they weren't they were thought to be linked but really they weren't linked at all it just was more of a coincidence um on that one um dna was on the Alex, only one shot though right or um was there was there... the other one that was shot but that was and that's why like i think they kind of investigated to see if they linked so they, there was two killers rather than one but right um, so that wasn't explained but the DNA of Alice Coleman's clothes was a positive match for John Norman Collins. And um, he continued to this day, he continues to deny his involvement with the crimes, um, but he has exhausted all of his appeals. So um, he is rotting away in jail or in prison rather, not jail. Well, good. He needs to be. So mm -hmm. that is the story. Oh. A very graphic story of, the Ypsilanti Ripper slash Michigan murderer slash co-ed killer. Co -ed. Yeah. I remember him being the co-ed killer. Obviously, I don't remember the this happening, but yeah. early well, 80, probably around 81, 82, 83, something like that. At work, we all read this book. And I I can't remember exactly what it was called, but I know he we went by the co-ed killer. Yeah. And well, there's lots of so there's so Ted Bundy was also known as the co-ed killer though. So that's right. the thing. Right. Well, is like that's this like, one was that's in that really Arbor, I know because you know we're not that far. And um especially in nineteen eighty wasn't two, we lived Ted no no, no Ted Ed Bundy. Kemper was Ed Kemper was. Okay. But anyways, um so we all killer. at work read the book. We took turns yeah. reading this book, so we discussed it, and it was really scary because uh, yeah. it had lots of pictures, graphic pictures, and yeah, um, yeah. you know, pictures of uh, you know, yeah, car and stuff like that. Yeah, there was a lot. I I found a lot of like the Wikipedia page for this. Um, yeah, was like it's huge. It's it was I've never seen a Wikipedia Wikipedia page so big. So. Um, there was a lot of information. Oh, and also I forgot about this. Um, I can't. I didn't write it down, so I don't remember. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. 
supposedly there's a being a movie being made about this one too. So there could be, or maybe they're a documentary or something, something along those lines where they're doing some kind of documentary or movie um, for this murder or this serial killer person. So, but I kind of wonder too, like my theories on, like I said, he either is not smart or he is smart and he's just a narcissist and like thinks he can get away with it. Or he continues to deny it. Like, does he have multiple personality disorder, you know, kind of thing just because he had a very rough childhood. I'm sure he like went into some coping mechanisms as a child. Um, but I feel like, and again, it's not, I don't know if I remember the story right or not, but I feel like um, he had a lot of anguish afterwards for doing that, but it, something just took over him and he did it. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. Each time he would really regret what he did. But, but then he also went back and then he moved the body every single time. Right. So like, I think that's just something he probably did said to get sympathy. I, I remember, again, again, I don't know if I remember this right or not, but it seems like they there was a lot of focus on he was really trying to get caught. You know, he, that's knew, a, he, that's was, like, and he knew he was going to continue until he got caught. So he was like trying and to And that's kind of, him. I guess that's where I kind of feel like is that like he knew in his mind he wasn't doing good and was trying to get himself caught so that he could be caught. But also at the same time, I don't know. There's a really good no, book detailed it book about it. I know that. And it was, like I said, this would have been early 80s when I was reading it. So, And I think, you know, because it, it mentioned in all the stories that, like, all the, the killings stopped as soon as he was arrested. And I think it was, like, at the point where, like, the police weren't 100% sure, which I don't know how, but they weren't 100% sure it was him. So that was like significant evidence that he was the killer because it's right, not, you know. But like really, like going back to the like the very first one, he w- like he was identified from the very beginning, and police just kind of ignored it. So right, kind of sad. Well, that yeah. So that's kind of where I don't think it. Situations. I don't think it was before. Multiple. Because that was like the whole thing is that he went to that funeral home. I was like, can I take some uh, pictures yeah, for the yeah. family? Like, that doesn't sound that's remorseful to me. That sounds like no. he wanted trophies. Right. right. Um, and again, it was, we've, we've heard this story over and over again, but he was, you know, a good looking young man. Right. Right. And so people just can't believe that, right. you know, they look the other way because they can't believe that, you know, they're expecting some monster. You know, right. So. And that's what, you know, just like you know, with Ted Budney and um, Jeffrey Dahmer and, they're charismatic people. Right. That right. um and John Kaczynski, you know, like they're all very likable people and they charm people. Well, I know. Right. Not likable. Head but they head charm people. You know. They charm people. They yeah. win people over. And... <sighs> yeah. What do you laugh at? Good story. I'm, I I don't think you're thinking of the right person because Ted Kaczynski was like really antisocial and was like a loner. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm thinking of somebody He's the else. Unibomber. Yeah. But there you go. There's my, my story. Yes. It's unknown. He's never claimed to murder these ones, so he's never claimed to murder more, but there's, you know, the, the theory is that he murdered more because, and maybe... Maybe not, but like they started out, it was like one, and then a year later, another, and then almost a year later. And so it's like the period between the murders got shorter and shorter as it went. But mm-hmm. I mean, also at the same time, I feel like, and I'm not a murderer, but like if you do it once, you're not going to wait a year to do it again, kind of thing. Well, so, it could be uh, like that thing where he was, because especially because he went to the funeral home, he was kind of like, well, I can't keep doing it. But then it was like every time he murdered and he didn't get caught, it was like, okay, well, I can get away with it again and I can get away with it again and a shorter time to get away with again. Yeah. And maybe with his first one, when he went to the funeral home, he didn't get a trophy where all the rest of them, he had a trophy. Yeah. Well, he did get a trophy. 
he probably did get a trophy because she was missing limbs. So yeah. I'm sure he yeah. got trophies. It was just that he wanted that. Extra and that could have been in his box that he destroyed. Right. And he destroyed it. I'm assuming he burned it. You know, like I'm assuming he did something along those lines. But I don't know. But that's my story for the week. There's some crazy people in our world. It's a little gruesome. Yes. Yeah. And it's all like that's we I think we've talked about it before. In the Ann Arbor area. It's like yeah. crazy yeah. psychotic. Well, it's yeah. like college. Eastern and U of M are there. And so there's yeah. a lot of young mm -hmm. people there and crop, you know. It draws in that kind of person. Not in our college campuses, I should say. Yeah. You just got to be careful wherever you're at. Yeah. It's just kind of crazy to kind of think about. And I just, for me, like the girls using the buddy system, that was something that like when I went for orientation, I was told, make sure you use a buddy system, you know? And I think that was something that was created because of this murder or yeah. these, these um, serial like the, the murders and uh, this, everything. So this story is brought up a lot when they're talking about serial killers and, Mm -hmm. you know, I've like, never heard of it. I never heard about it until um, I think I saw this one like on TikTok. I think I've that's where I got the idea. It. And then I'm like, holy cow, this is in Michigan. It's crazy. And then I like started doing the research. I'm like, holy cow. Yeah. Like, I've kind of maybe crazy. I've heard the term Ypsilanti Ripper, but also it, like all of his names are basically, well, he did it before a lot of people, but like it yeah. seems like yeah. a version of another, you know. Yeah, and right. Yeah, and I definitely remember them talking in this book about the the medium that came psychic and yeah, really helped them solve it and stuff. Yeah, yeah. There you go. They brought a psychic in. They he, the psychic didn't help them solve, but they gave additional information. If there's a Hope psychic that there's out there that would like to be a guest on our show, please let us know. Yeah. Right. Of course, we'd have to vent them somehow or another. Because, anyways, <laughs> and the second they bring up a red car, you'd be like, "Good, that's yep. it. You got that's the job." I've already told that story ready. on this show, so if they bring that up, it's not going to impress me. <laughs> there are things they don't know about me yet, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We are kind of all open book, so it'd be hard to really it'd be hard to we've prove told anything. All stories. <laughs> there you go. Okay, hmm. well, good topic. Enjoyed it. I hope you guys like that story. I'm gonna have nightmares. It was kind of a long one. I didn't realize the, the it book, until I the started. The book was really scary. I mean, I remember really. It was really yeah. scary. And um, again, like we were conversing about it. Yeah, it worked, yeah. you know. Oh, just now I want to read the book. book. I'm going to have to look to see what, Me too. what the book is. So. But yeah. And I like that was, I feel like that was a long story that I just provided. And that was like the minimum. highlights. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a lot of information out there, but. I don't know. So there you go. Go to go to sleep. Have sweet dreams. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's that's pretty scary. Maybe put a disclaimer at the beginning of this episode. Got some gruesome. Good morning. Yeah. Great. Right. Well, anyways, remember we talked about Donnie Darko, and so yes, if you guys have a chance to watch that movie. I think we might be discussing that. Analyzing it, and um, yeah, somebody's got to watch the movie and not fall asleep. Yeah, especially since it's their week to discuss, so they uh -huh. have to start the conversation. Uh -huh. <laughs> you All right, guys, understand the movie to <laughs> speak about it. Well, it is a very good movie, and it's a good movie that every time you watch it, you see a different angle. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It really is more confusing the more you watch it. But I think I got it down pat. Okay. I think I, I think I got a good angle, and I just picked this up 
actually, I didn't even pick it up. Somebody else told me. Mm. And I thought, yeah, that's it. So, anyways, okay. I don't want to give too much of that away. But no. um, anything else you guys want to talk about? Nope. Like, share, subscribe. All right. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. We look forward to doing the show every week. Um, and we will see you next time. See Bye. you next time. Bye.